This is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Good morning, Vietnam. Good morning. March, 1965. John Paul Van returns to South Vietnam for the first time in three years. When Van was last there, it was as part of the U.S. MACV, commanded by Westmoreland's predecessor, General Paul Harkins. Entrenching himself in all aspects of the ground in South Vietnam, Van quickly uncovered many truths, primarily the South Vietnamese's lack of will to fight their enemies. The South Vietnamese Rangers uh, were a, a, a very good cut of soldier, but for the general soldier, they didn't have the spirit that they should have. And when their country was being invaded from the North, I think they should have fought harder. Witnessing the corruption of the DM government and the military standstill against the Viet Cong, Van makes it his mission to convey the truth about Vietnam to his superiors and the incompetency on display at the Battle of Ap Bac. Returning to America in April 1963, Van's final report as a senior advisor uses inarguable statistics to show that the amount of enemy troops killed was actually two-thirds lesser than reality, with the MACV counting civilians killed as enemy troops. Unable to get a forum in Washington over his concerns and feeling stuck in a dead end, John Paul Van left the army in July 1963. His courage in talking to the media, particularly the New York Times reporter David Halberstam, brought attention to the government's shortcomings in the Vietnam War. Now, Van is still determined to improve the situation in Vietnam but this time as an official of the Agency for International Development, the U.S. government's Agency for Foreign Civilian Aid. He will be in it for the long haul. On 22nd February, 1965, General William C. Westmoreland, USA Commander, U.S. Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, requested two Marine battalions to protect the key air base at Da Nang from increasing threat by the Viet Cong to U.S. installations. In response, on the 8th of March, 1965, the 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, the MEB, landed at Da Nang. By the end of March, nearly 5,000 Marines were at Da Nang, including two infantry battalions, two helicopter squadrons, and supply and logistics units. In April, the U.S. government agreed to deploy still more Marines to Vietnam and to permit those at Da Nang to engage in counterinsurgency operations. The U.S. Marine Corps' new presence will be a strong one until war's end and an incredibly welcome one by the South Vietnamese. It is March 8, 1965 when three ships, the USS Henrico, Union, and Vancouver, deliver the 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade to a station north of Da Nang. When the first Marines land on Vietnamese soil at 8.15 a.m., they are in full battle gear and brandishing M14 assault rifles. They were not expecting the welcome that was awaiting them. Four American GIs hold up a sign that says, Welcome, gallant Marines, standing amongst the South Vietnamese officers and Vietnamese girls awaiting their arrival. This first deployment of Marines numbers 3,500. It is no wonder that they are eagerly invited to South Vietnam. The unforgiving environment requires soldiers capable of handling both land and sea fighting. The Marines will not only come in to fight, but also to build a stronger South Vietnam 
through the Combined Action Program. This effective counterinsurgency tool was used to combat the intense guerrilla warfare that U.S. forces faced, in addition to the traditional military fighting. Marine platoons are stationed in and around rural Vietnamese villages to provide training and security from Viet Cong belligerents for the people who lived there. The CAP, or CAP, program will go down as one of the few lasting and successful operations of the Vietnam War. It is estimated that none of the over 200 villages that were a part of this program were ever given over to Viet Cong control. But the Marines will see plenty of fighting, however, starting with Operation Starlight, an amphibious and air assault that will cement the Marine Corps' invaluable presence in the Vietnam War. The Marines at Vital Communications Base Chu Lai, under command of Lieutenant General Louis W. Walt, receive intelligence from a Viet Cong defector that a VC regiment waits in hiding in the nearby village of Van Tuong. Lieutenant General Walt can wait for the Viet Cong to strike, or he can take the battle to them. Walt and his men have less than three days to plan the operation. It takes two nights at Da Nang's 3rd Marine Division headquarters of planning, two sleepless nights. But what they come up with is unprecedented in this young war. Operation Starlight will be the first fully American military operation in the Vietnam War. A hammer and anvil battle. The Marines will provide a hammer strike by the amphibious force landing on Green Beach, while Marines brought in by helicopter on three different landing zones will be the anvil upon which the VC are struck. They will push the Viet Cong between the two forces, crushing them. The beach is soon swarming with invading Marines, while the three LZs are met with descending copters, dispensing a company each. LZ White's company encounters some mortar and small arms fire, but they are able to push eastward. LZ Blue, however, is where the Marines of Hotel Company face opposition. It is located in direct line with the headquarters of the 60th Battalion, 1st VC Regiment. With two objectives, the nearby village of Nam Yen 3 and Hill 43, Commanding Officer Lieutenant Jenkins takes the aggressive stance of taking both at once. The Marines underestimate the Viet Cong's wiliness. Many huts in Nam Yen 3 are actually concealed bunkers, while the men at Hill 43 face off against a fortified Viet Cong force. Jenkins brings his men together, and with the help of arriving UH-1 Huey gunships and tanks from the amphibious force, Jenkins takes off for the hill and then heads towards Nam Yen 3. Captain Webb's India Company go after Viet Cong in the village of An Kuang 2, where Webb had to get permission to leave his designated area of attack. Once granted, his company is joined by M48 tanks from the beach. Unfortunately, a wide trench prevents tank movement in, leaving the Marine squad under command of Corporal O'Malley and Lance Corporal Chris Books to personally jump into the trench to attack VC soldiers. O'Malley keeps fighting the enemy, despite being wounded three times. The wounds fail to keep him from running into the battlefield to save wounded Marines. The remainder of India face off against the VC in the village, making short work of them. One Viet Cong, playing opossum, rolls back over and frags Captain Webb and other Marines with a grenade. Webb and two other Marines are killed in the explosion. Meanwhile, First Lieutenant Jenkins once more attempts to take Nam Yen 3, but he is almost flanked by an expertly camouflaged VC force. Lieutenant Corporal Ernie Wallace single-handedly goes after the VC with his M60 machine gun, eliminating 25 of the enemy. The Viet Cong presence at Nam Yen 3 is still too strong, 
and Jenkins' men are forced to withdraw back to LZ Blue after a high loss of life. Only 28 Marines are left in fighting form by the time they reach LZ Blue. A supply convoy en route to India Company is ambushed and trapped by the Viet Cong at noon. First Lieutenant Cochran, commanding officer, is killed, leaving Staff Sergeant Jack Marino to continue the fight well into the night. India Company join the battalion, and a second column is sent to assist the ambushed column, but it is soon driven back by enemy fire. Artillery and air support arrives, including F-4 fighter jets dropping cluster bomb payloads. By nightfall, the Marines ready themselves in defensive positions, waiting for the enemy to strike once more. The Viet Cong, masters of the terrain, retreat under cover of dark, leaving behind over 600 dead. The United States Marine lose nearly 50 men, with around 200 wounded. Two of their own, Corporal O'Malley and Lance Corporal Paul, receive the Medal of Honor for their action. President Lyndon B. Johnson presents O'Malley with his medal on December 6, 1966. O'Malley's citation reads as follows. Although three times wounded in this encounter and facing imminent death from a fanatic and determined enemy, he steadfastly refused evacuation and continued to cover his squad's boarding of the helicopters while from an exposed position, he delivered fire against the enemy until his wounded men were evacuated. Only then, with his last mission accomplished, did he permit himself to be removed from the battlefield. By his valor, leadership, and courageous efforts in behalf of his comrades, he served as an inspiration to all who observed him and reflected the highest credit upon the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. On February 7, 1967, Lance Corporal Joe C. Paul receives his posthumous Medal of Honor. Corporal Paul, fully aware that his tactics would almost certainly result in serious injury or death to himself, chose to disregard his own safety and boldly dashed across the fire-swept rice paddies, placing himself between his wounded comrades and the enemy and delivered effective suppressive fire with his automatic weapon in order to divert the attack long enough to allow the casualties to be evacuated. Although critically wounded during the course of the battle, he resolutely remained in his exposed position and continued to fire his rifle until he collapsed and was evacuated. By his fortitude and gallant spirit of self-sacrifice in the face of almost certain death, he saved the lives of several of his fellow Marines. His heroic actions served to inspire all who observed him and reflect the highest credit upon himself, the Marine Corps, and the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life in the cause of freedom. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, Please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.